Let's talk to Alex Phillips, though, former Brexit Party MEP. I don't know if you'll know the answer to that, Alex. Welcome to uh, the show. Hi, good to be on. Yeah, do you know, I mean, I, I presume the, the quarantine time of 4am is this is when you have to leave France by, or rather than this is when you have to get back here by. Well, do you know what? Who knows? Uh, they, they probably haven't even <laughs> themselves, to be honest. And does the problem is, does it even make a difference? If you left at 3pm or 4am, does it make a difference? Well, the virus well, this, is, there this, this is exactly what the problem is, right? Because, you know, so, for example, if you get back at 3.45 to your house in Hounslow, um, you know, you're fine. But if you have to take the extra 20 minutes to get to your house at five minutes past four uh, in sort of East London, then you've got to stay inside for two weeks. Yeah, but, you know, the whole thing is just a ramshackle hodgepodge of constant policy changing. Nobody knows whether they're coming or going. I mean, even this morning, indirectly, via domino effect, my entire next week plans are now changed right. because they put in quarantine against the Netherlands and it's sort of precipitated down to affect me right. um, remotely and indirectly. But it's still frustrating. And I think most people are feeling this. And you can't brush a virus under the carpet. Those countries who imposed a very strict lockdown are now finding a bit of a resurgence because guess what a virus doesn't just magically disappear you can't put it in a jam jar put an airtight lid on put it on the shelf and say don't come back right so what we're seeing is this sort of natural occurrence of an uptick which is going to happen the only country which, which is not really seeing it is sweden which as we know went for a completely different route but we need to get on with our lives i mean my good friend who's now unable to go on holiday to holland as she had planned the lovely belinda de Lucy, who i'm sure listeners um very, know very well yes She's had COVID-19, as have I. It tore through her whole family a couple of months ago, and there's not been a single case of reinfection anywhere in the world. And now they're having a mad scramble last minute to try and completely change all their plans, which have been totally upended. And it's a charade. I mean, why is she even taking place in this process when her and her family have had the infection go through the household and therefore should be um, quite protected? Yeah. No, I've heard a story today um, about a, a family who booked a whole holiday in Spain, then changed it to France after Spain was put on the quarantine list and now are stuck with a place in France that they can't go to. So people are getting, you know, and I know that it sounds like very first world problems that you can't actually, um, you know, go on holiday. So it must be a terrible trauma. But there's a lot of money at stake here and there's a lot of sort of organisation at stake. And of course, kids are going to be back at school soon as well. So, you know, it's wreaking havoc. And I don't really see why, to be honest. Yeah, you know, you call it first world problems, but this is actually a big developing world problem as well, because there are countries like Kenya, for instance, where I used to live, which normally has a very thriving tourism industry. Mm. And at the moment is on complete lockdown. There's no flights in or out. I understand a little bit more. They're actually trying to stop the virus getting into the country in a lot of those areas, which doesn't have as don't have as a greater footfall, I'd say, when it comes to travel. There's um, the West. Mm. Uh, but, you know, it, it is affecting businesses. It's affecting. I mean, it, it might be good for the UK state vacation industry which we need to inject that back into the country but we've got the threat of regional lockdown as well at what point are we going to turn around and say the virus is here we need to learn to live with it and guess what we know who it affects by now we know exactly who's vulnerable people are, are, are very aware if they've had it or not we can't test everyone for antibodies not everybody has antibodies but surely by now the obvious choice would be to shield those who are vulnerable and everyone else just crack on yeah exactly right um because, I mean, the good news, I suppose, uh, for you not being able to go or for anybody not being able to go to Holland anymore is you can go down and uh, get, get stuck into the local bowling alley, uh, which will be opening this weekend. Uh, similarly, the casinos are opening. You know, there's all kinds of strange things happening. And none of it, it's almost as though there's a there's a guy sort of sitting, I mean, it's all about whack-a-mole. It's more like a guy sitting with a blindfold on, kind of, you know, trying to pin the, the tail on the donkey. Yeah, no, it is. I actually think that they've got this sort of, you know, ball feeder like you have when you're practicing your serve in tennis. And it's yeah. a random policy generator. <laughs> Someone in number 10 just, you know, serving these things over yeah. the net. Um, and it's just unpredictable and it's no way to run a country. You know, it's where well, people need to know what they're doing from one week to the next at the end of the day, whether it's affecting your, your life in a personal capacity, but especially for businesses. Mm. And 
like I said, we know what we're dealing with now. It's been months since this virus has stalked through Europe. We know who it affects. We actually have a lot better idea of how to treat it. We built an overflow Nightingale hospitals, which were never used. Mm. We've prepared ourselves to see this thing off and instead are sort of trying to hide behind a curtain saying, is it going to notice we're here? I mean, it's almost ludicrous. I think we've got global mass hysteria now and one country is looking to another and are they changing their rules? Are they blocking people? It's all sort of copycat. Nobody seems to be thinking independently. Nobody's thinking strategically. No. It's active and it's destructive. It really is, because, I mean, when you look at somewhere like uh, Australia and Melbourne, you know, down there, they're putting people on a curfew. So at eight o'clock at night, you're not allowed to go out, you know, and it's really just it's a very bizarre. And, and when you look at all of the infection rates going up, what nobody seems to be doing uh, is actually looking at the hospital admission rates, which are not going up. Right. That's very true. The death rate's going down and infections are going, but the infections are going up, you know, enormously. I mean, remember when Chris Whitty suddenly wet himself and decided that everyone had to quarantine coming back from Spain because 10 people right. had been infected oh, over no. there. And, you, you know, it, as proportions now, these things are tiny. And the government was supposed to be setting up this track and trace app. Back in the day, it was going to be world leading. They rolled it out on the Isle of Wight and it all just went horribly wrong because they procured it from best mates or whatever and hadn't actually done the proper R&D. And now they've done the R&D and decided they're going to use the Apple and Google technology. And once again, they're testing it on the Isle of Wight. And we just seem to have all of these great concepts of how to beat this virus in train and none of them come to fruition. It's been bunged bungle after bungle and then as a result we've got this reactive policy making which is just leading everybody down the path of utter chaos and I think it's totally unnecessary that's the rub it's sort of tyranny mixed with incompetence which is a really deadly cocktail well I politics. think the problem is is that and I've said this for many uh, a week now that there's clearly a battle going on inside number 10 between the scientists uh, and the politicians because clearly people like Michael Gove who seems to have disappeared off the face of the earth because nobody wants to hear from him now in government uh, is very very much one of those like you who wants to just get on with it and make sure that we actually get our economy back before anything else happens to make it even worse than it is already. And then the, the, like the Chris Whitties of this world, who while at the same time is saying, oh, yes, well, we're getting the uh, infection rate down really low. Uh, we look as if look as if we're winning that. But at the same time, we're going to quarantine a load of people uh, who don't have it. Right. And, you know, whenever I see these scientists pop up behind their lecterns, you know, they don't they, they look a bit like they're scared of their own shadows, a few of them. And scientists are not the people who necessarily govern a country because governing in a country takes conviction. It means looking at the evidence in front of you, a lot of which may be contradictory, listening to all the different opinions, weighing it up and then saying, right, we're going to pursue this particular strategy because it is the best compromise or it's going to it's the most bespoke approach for what this country needs. But instead, we've got a government who wants to churn out all this random policy but want to be held accountable for none of it mm. which is why they keep saying things like we're being guided by the science we're being guided by the science so they can say well it's not us chris witty told us to do it it's not us it was patrick valance but the scientists themselves don't agree and so what you end up with is as soon as a scientist raises their voice sticks up their hand and says right i think we should you know quarantine people coming back from turks and caicos is now one of them i mean you know that that leprosy island in the caribbean <laughs> right <laughs> and you know and so they're just saying, right, this scientist has said it, we better do it because come the day there's going to be an inquiry, you don't want to be the person who happened to lift that trapdoor a little bit too high and then, you know, be held That's accountable. That's crazy. It is crazy. What do you make of this a story in the front of the Times today as well saying that they're now thinking of upping the fine for not wearing a face mask to 3,000 quid? Yeah, well, I know it's three thousand pounds. That is just insane, yeah. and uh, I, I disagree entirely with that premise. Having a small fine in place, I'm I'm completely over face masks now. I mean, I wear one. I think it reassures other people, but I'm I, I question very much what use they do. And I think when you travel on public transport as often as I do, you realise that most people are beginning to flout the rules now. You know, you've got yeah. the little nose poking out over the top or the little sitter under the chin and you can't blame people because in this hot weather it's been incredibly stuffy and tight and yeah it really has and also muscle. and also i'm not sure even what the rules are because they're so kind of um you know shall we say inconsistent i mean i walked into a shopping center the other day um because i was going to the dry cleaners and i didn't have a mask on and it didn't occur to me to put one on just to walk through the shopping center and some people were wearing it and some people weren't and i got to the dry yeah. cleaners and they were both wearing masks inside and i said Do you want me to wear a mask and they said it's up to you so i said were you well, taking a mask 
be dry cleaned? That's the question. Because now no. people are sort of <laughs> in these non-disposable masks. And in theory, you're supposed to wash them at 60 degrees every time you wear them, take them home, wear them for about 20 minutes only yeah. or, or whatever. Everyone's walking around with these sort of halitosis ridden, you know, sodden, horrible, musty rags on their no, faces. It's far more infection than <laughs> <laughs> not wearing one. No. Um, it's a psychological cult we've now joined. And I think it is supposed to help people feel more comfortable about coming out and socially distancing, but it's creating this subculture of anti-maskers and maskers and yeah. curtains and finger pointing. Yeah. And all of this stuff just creates social tension. It doesn't really do much to minimize the spread of infection. No, I don't think it does. And that is the basic problem. Listen, Alex, well, hopefully uh, we will manage to uh, get you into the studio at some point soon because that may happen sooner rather than later. But we still can't at the moment because we still don't know what the rules are on that. But thank you very much indeed. Alex Phillips, former Brexit Party MEP, uh, talking to us there about all sorts of things. But, you know, including the fact that, you know, yes, there's a quarantine if you're coming back from France, unless you're in a, uh, an illegal boat coming from uh, the, co the coast of uh, Calais, wearing face masks or not could end up costing you 3,000 quid of a fine. They're opening up casinos. They're opening up bowling alleys. They're opening up ice rinks. It's all a bit confusing, isn't it? This is Talk Radio.